first recorded miracle of Jesus, and apparently chronologically the first not only in John, but also in Jesus' life. We know that John is including things that are left out of the other Gospels, and they include things that John leaves out of his. And in the harmonizing of these things chronologically, uh, it's not always extremely obvious how things fit together, but it does seem that this miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana preceded all the miracles that Jesus did in Galilee. Well, this actually it was in Galilee, but it was before his Galilean ministry commenced. Jesus at this point was still in the midst of what we would refer to as his, his year of obscurity. Uh, his year of popularity began when he heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison. Th this has not yet occurred in the material we're reading. So this is before that. But the Synoptic Gospels tell us that when John the Baptist was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the kingdom of God, working miracles and so forth, and uh, drew a lot of attention to himself. But all of those are further ahead into the future from the standpoint of where we're looking right now. So as far as we know, the turning of water into wine was the only miracle Jesus has done up to this point. It is referred to as the beginning of signs in verse 11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And so he has now kind of broken out of his um, shell, we might say. He spent 30 years just living like an ordinary man, like a, a carpenter in Nazareth, working with wood, probably supporting his mother after his, his stepfather or foster father, Joseph, had, had died. And Jesus has now come out and he's begun to do other things. We'll find by the end of this chapter, uh, he has done more miracles, but we're not told what they are. He still has not begun his Galilean ministry until after chapter 4 of John. But we do see some miracles or signs he does because it says in verse 23, uh, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And that sets the stage for chapter 3 where Nicodemus comes to him and says in chapter 3 verse 2, uh, Rabbi, uh, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So there are, soon after the wedding feast of Cana, there are to be signs, additional signs, done in Jerusalem. But we have no distinct record of what they were. But it would appear that Jesus began to publicly do signs in Jerusalem before he began his public ministry in Galilee. Galilee was really his primary ministry. But John, probably writing after the other apostles were all dead, and not wishing to have his memories of, of his time with Jesus uh, you know, perish with him when he would die as an old man. Uh, he's putting down things that were not in the other Gospels. And which he did not wish to have disappear with him. Now, one of the things that he includes is a cleansing of the temple by Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, in the Synoptic Gospels... All three of them tell us that Jesus cleansed the temple with a whip of small cords. But the difference is that in all of those Gospels, it is at the end of Jesus' life. It is in the Passion Week that the other Gospels place this cleansing of the temple. And all three of the other Gospels give it. And, and the, uh, there are, there are scholars sometimes think maybe John has put it out of proper order here. But I think it's more likely that what John has done is told us of a, an earlier cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the synoptics tell us about a, a second one at the end of his ministry. It would be like John to uh, tell us something that's supplementary rather than a duplication of what the other Gospels say. There's very little duplication in John. Uh, the only, actually, the only thing in John's Gospel that duplicates the other Gospels, is the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. And, and of course, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. But apart from that, the book is almost entirely unique material that, that fills in gaps in the other Gospels. And so I'm of the opinion that Jesus cleansed the temple twice. 
and once was at this very early stage, and once was at the very end of his ministry. Now, why would he have to do it twice? Well, for the same reason he'd have to do it once. Uh, because uh, the, the temple was being abused. And he did not like that, and so he cleansed it. And then apparently, like three years later, something like that, it had, of course, in the interim, fallen back into abuse, probably the entire time. And so he cleansed it one more time at the end of his life. To say these are the same incident, but just put in a different chronological place in John would be to ignore many differences between the accounts. Jesus said different things on the two occasions. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record what Jesus said in the cleansing of the temple, and they all agree that he said, uh, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. In this passage, there's no reference to a den of thieves or the the fact that the uh, Father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. Instead, he says, do not make my Father's house a house of merchandise. The house of merchandise isn't the same thing as thievery. Uh, you know, any, any shop is a place of merchandise, but it's not necessarily thievery. A den of thieves is obviously something much more corrupt. In this occasion, Jesus doesn't raise the same complaint. Uh, and the results are different. In this case, we're going to find that after Jesus has done this, he has a conversation with the, his, uh, with, with the people in power there who ask him by, to give them a sign how he is able to do what he's doing or, or claim to do. In the other cases, in the Sanctic Gospels, after he cleansed the temple, it says they were afraid to do anything to him, but they wanted to kill him. And so it's really a, a different story. The only thing in common is in both cases, Jesus goes in with a whip and drives out the money changers and the animals from the temple. We read of it in beginning of verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now up from, from Capernaum, actually, because after he had turned the water into wine in Cana, which is in Galilee, he, in verse 12, went with his mother, his brothers, and whatever disciples were already with him to Capernaum. And he was there for a little while, not many days, it says. And from there, he went up to Jerusalem. Now, up to Jerusalem is actually south of Galilee. When we speak of going south, we usually say down. And when we say north, we mean up. But, um, of course, there's no reason why ancient societies or other cultures should use our convention of speech that way. Uh, when they speak of up, they think of elevation. And Jerusalem was on a hill. What's more, any approach to Jerusalem from any direction was up, because they think of it as an elevated place in more than, uh, more than a geographical sense or a topographical sense. It is an elevated place spiritually. The temple was there, and so it's always an ascent when you approach the temple. And so the Bible always speaks about going up to Jerusalem, no matter what direction you're coming from. They have been in Capernaum. We have no record of anything they did in Capernaum in these not many days, it says at the end of verse 12. They say they're not many days. But we do know that on a later occasion, Capernaum became his headquarters of ministry. In fact, it was the place where at a later time he would call the fishermen to follow him from their nets, whom he had met earlier in chapter 1, but had not called to follow him. So the fishermen had met him at another location. They may have seen him during these few days at Capernaum also, though again we don't find him calling them to follow him until later, once he begins his Galilean campaign. But from Galilee, from Capernaum, it, he goes up to Jerusalem because it says the Passover is near. Now the Passover was one of three feasts in the Jewish calendar that all adult male Jews, if possible, were supposed to uh, recognize by going to Jerusalem. Uh, Passover was a week long. Actually, the Passover itself was a single day, but there was uh, seven days following where the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the whole week was considered to be uh, the Passover season. And then uh, 50 days after Passover was Pentecost, and that also was a week long celebration. And then later on, at the end of the summer, there was uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. That was also a week long. And Obviously, it would not be practical for Jews of the diaspora all over the Mediterranean world to come 
make a trip like that three times a year. But anyone who could, who was a Jew above 12 years of age, was supposed to do so if they were male. The women could stay home with the littler children if they wished, but, or the whole family could come. But the uh, men were supposed to do it if they could. Obviously, there was no penalty for missing it. And it's probable that many, many Jews could only come very rarely because if they were poor and lived far away, that kind of a trip is not an easy thing to do. However, Palestinian Jews, like Jesus' disciples who lived in the country, could rather easily walk there. From Capernaum to Jerusalem is probably close to a week's walk, but they were used to that kind of thing. They didn't get places quickly in those days, and walking about the country, a small country like Israel, was something people were accustomed to. And so Jesus' disciples, no doubt, walked to Jerusalem every time there was one of these feasts. We don't have record of all the feasts, but one thing is important. This is a Passover, and there are two other Passovers named in the ministry of Jesus. And it's from these Passovers that we sort of deduce the length, overall length of his ministry. We usually hear that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years long. It may have been, but it may have been two and a half years long. No one really knows for sure because there are three Passovers. This one is very early in his ministry, obviously before his Galilean campaign. In fact, we might say even before he had any public ministry going on at all, was this early Passover. He also died at a Passover. So the beginning and end of his public ministry were at Passovers, and these happen once a year, of course. There is one other Passover name in the middle, or somewhere in the midst of his ministry. It is in John chapter 6. And that is the occasion when he uh, fed the multitudes with the five loaves and two fishes. So there are three named Passovers. If his ministry began around the time of the first of them and ended at the, sec at the third, and there's one in the middle, that would make a total of two years of ministry. And obviously, this Passover is not the very first thing he did because he turned water to wine before this, and he called some disciples before this. So it'd be at least two years inclusive of these three Passovers, and something. Three years, uh, or two years and some change, you know, a few months maybe. And so it would be possibly two and a half years. But traditionally, it's thought to be three and a half years, and that's because there's another feast mentioned in John 5, 1, where it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, it could be any feast of the Jews. It could have been Passover, it could have been Pentecost, it could have been a tabernacle. But many scholars believe this feast was also uh, a Passover. If it was, then there are not three, but four Passovers in the ministry years of Jesus. And that would make his ministry have a Passover at the beginning, a Passover at the end, and two in the middle. That would be inclusive three years. And as I said, prior to John chapter 2, verse 13, there's been some activity. So his uh, ministry activity, perhaps from his baptism, to his crucifixion could be three and a half years, or if there were only three Passovers instead of four, then two and a half. No one knows for sure. Certainly there's nothing in John 5 to let us know that it was a Passover. But the assumption that it was is the, is the basis for thinking that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years long. There may be another reason, too, because uh, there was a parable Jesus told about a fig tree that wasn't producing fruit. And the gardener said, uh, or the, the owner said to the gardener, uh, this fruit, uh, this tree is not bearing fruit, it's just burning the ground. Why we should, let's cut it down, we don't have any use for it. He says, I've come three years looking for fruit from this tree. And the gardener said, well, let me, let's just do it one more year and see if it produces fruit. And if it doesn't, we'll cut it down. And, uh, of course, the most likely meaning of that parable is that Israel was that fig tree. In the three years, he mentioned, that they've been waiting for fruit was possibly the years that Jesus had been trying to cultivate it in his public ministry. And, and so they, they were in their last year of opportunity for that. Anyway, it's not essential that we know how many years Jesus' ministry was, but so that you might know the basis for the claim that his ministry was three and a half years, this is it. It has to do with the number of Passovers, which is itself not certain. But we have one that's certain. It's nailed down in black and white. This was a Passover of the Jews, and Jesus and his disciples probably went to Jerusalem every time there was one of these uh, annual feasts where it was expected for them to go. And, however, it was not a given that he would go, because 
in chapter 7, his brothers urged him to go down to Jerusalem to the feast as if maybe they weren't sure he was going to. And later on, I think it's in chapter 10, if I'm not mistaken, people are looking for Jesus and they're saying, do you think he'll come to the feast? Do you think he'll come to the feast? Like maybe he wouldn't. It's not a given that every Jew is going to go to, to these feasts, although the law required it. It was kind of quasi-optional. Obviously, some people's schedule and family obligations and work obligations would prevent it. But Jesus being a nomadic kind of a itinerant preacher, more often than not, would be free to make that trip. And he did on this occasion. It says in verse 14, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. Now, oxen and sheep and doves would be those animals that were most often offered as sacrifices. Um, goats also could be offered, but, and, and maybe they were there too, but just not mentioned. The thing is that certain sacrifices prescribed in Leviticus required oxen to be offered. And some required oxen and lambs, or, or merely lambs. And the poor were allowed to offer birds. Because a poor person could not always afford, uh, you know, an ox or a sheep even to offer. If they're very poor, they can hardly put food on their table. And so they were, they were still supposed to offer sacrifices, but they could offer birds if, if they wished. That was a special provision made for the poor. And so all these animals were available on sale in the temple. Now that was not something that God arranged for in the Old Testament. There was, there was not a marketplace uh, court of the temple. There was a court of the Gentiles, a court of women, there was a court of uh, the Jews, and so forth. The court of Israel would be called. And uh, yet there was not a court of the merchants. And Jesus found business going on in the temple selling these things. Now, ostensibly, this was a service provided for the pilgrims who came from other areas. If you wanted to come from Rome or Greece to Jerusalem and offer sacrifices, you might prefer not to bring your cow on the ship with you or walk all around the Mediterranean leading a cow and some sheep with you. You might instead wish to buy them once you got there. Just bring your money with you and you can buy an animal in Jerusalem and offer it. However, the law was very explicit that the animals offered had to be without any blemishes, without any flaws. Couldn't have a spot, even a freckle on the inner part of the lip was the, the, uh, the priest would reject an animal like that. It had to be absolutely flawless. Well, uh, it was no doubt the case that people would sometimes bring their own animals, and the priest could easily find some little speck on it somewhere and say, oh, sorry, you can't do that, you have to buy one of ours. You have to pay us so that they began to prey upon the worshipers. You know, the worshipers were just coming to worship God, and the priest turned it into an opportunity to make a lot of money off it. So that the people would begin to look at their temple worship with uh, anger and with, and, and with uh, disdain. They would, re they would resent having to go, because they'd realize that, you know, we're going to have to buy one of their animals at inflated prices there, when our animals should be good enough, but they'll find some fault with it, so we're, they're just going to soak us for money. And people would become cynical about this and, and not look forward to coming to worship God at the temple because it's going to be a, just another chance for them to get soaked and victimized. So, in other words, these merchants had turned the worship of God into something that the worshipers did not like, did not look forward to. I mean, not that they didn't love God, it's just that the other things that were associated with it, the, the rigmarole, the... the uh, the extra money that they're being charged for things, this would be something that would make them have rather a cynical attitude toward worship. Just as in our own time, there are people who have a cynical attitude toward church because it seems to them, or toward Christian media ministries, because it seems to them that they're always just asking for money. That's what you hear a lot, you know. Now, Churches have become sensitized to that more in, in modern times. I mean, I think a lot of pastors have come to realize people feel that way. And so a lot of the, a lot of the churches, the ones that tend to be more popular, really play that down. And they don't seem to beg for money an awful lot. You'll still hear it, though, in some of the smaller churches because they need more money, frankly, because they're small and they don't have many people supporting them. But people have sometimes gotten the impression that the church is just going to want their money. And there are people that... 
I, I know I grew up hearing people complain they didn't want to go to church because they're just going to be put under pressure for money. And so they don't, when you go to church, you're supposed to go there to, to you know, enjoy God, to enjoy worshiping God. But when there's this, uh, this monetary uh, aspect that people resent, then the worship of God seems odious to them. And that's what was true, I believe, in the case with Eli's sons. Eli's sons were priests. And they, uh, you know, they, 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 they abused their position in a big way. Eli's sons, I think, actually slept with the women who came to worship there and took some of the portion of the meat for themselves that was supposed to be burned or, and given to God. And, and it says that the worship of God became odious in the sight of the people. People didn't want to worship God because the priests were taking advantage of them when they go. And they didn't have any choice. They couldn't elect new priests. The, pr the priesthood was hereditary, you know? The priest was the son of the previous priest and the grandson of the one before that. So those who sort of oversee the worship of God, the public worship of God, whether they're the priests in the temple or pastors and elders of the church, uh, they need to be careful that they're not using their position in a way that will simply further their own financial interests and make people not want to worship God because they see it through a jaundiced eye. Uh, they see there's you know something corrupt about it. And of course we know that many media ministries, especially uh, especially uh, Christian TV, have been exposed because they soak widows like the Pharisees. They they uh, what's he say? They rob widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Many of the people who support media ministries are widows on fixed incomes and so forth. And the, a lot of the men who are on these these expensive TV ministries and are trying to soak people, they know it's coming from women on fixed incomes. They know it's coming from widows. It's the biggest uh, sector that contributes to them, I think. And, and then these guys get caught, either absconding or wasting or using too much of the money for the wrong things, and it, it just makes people have a, uh, a sour taste in their mouth about Christianity in general. And that is something that ministers can ruin people's love for God in a way, or at least their desire to worship Him in any public way. And that's what was going on in the temple here. Jesus came there and He saw all this business going on in the temple. Now, by the way, a lot of churches now have businesses set up. The big, really big churches, the really big secret sense of churches, they have, they might have bookstores, which is convenient actually for, for the parishioners if people want to buy Christian books. It's, it's more convenient to do it right while they're at church. Uh, they might even have a coffee shop in there and stuff. And I'm not, I'm not really commenting on whether a church building should have more parts of it that offer different things besides a, a sanctuary. <laughs> Because church buildings aren't scriptural anyway. I mean, if you're going to have a church building, I don't know that we can say there are biblical perimeters for church buildings, because there aren't any. There are no church buildings in the Bible, nor any assumption that there would be church buildings. The church is not a building. But it, it, it can be so that the, the church becomes a place where some people seek to make money off of the other people who come there. I know there, for a fact, because I've met them, there are people who are make their living in sales, maybe insurance salesmen or you know, people like that who go to church for no other reason than to uh, develop relationships with potential customers. And they turn the church of God, the temple of God, into a house of merchandise. That's all they're there for is to further their business and not to worship God. So there's many ways in which what these money changers were doing might be duplicated even though they weren't doing anything criminal. But they were, they were just doing the, the wrong thing and uh, turning temple worship into something that was a lucrative business for them rather than just something where God is glorified and God is loved and God is worshipped by people who, uh, who just enjoy coming to, before God like David did. Remember David said in his day, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, he means the temple. Uh, in his case, the tabernacle, and, and that I might meditate in his temple, 
I might behold the beauty of the Lord. That's the ideal. Uh, people, when they come to public worship, they come to meditate and to behold the beauty of the Lord and, and not ever want to leave that place. But uh, public worship can be turned into something else by those who manage it, the handler. And the temple handlers had allowed that to happen at the temple. And by the way, there wasn't another denomination down the street people could go to if they didn't like the, the priests at this temple. There weren't two temples. There was one in the whole world, and it's one they had to go to. So it's not even as if, you know, I don't like the way this preacher does things, so I'm going to go down to this next church. They had to go to this one. And so it was definitely, uh, it was the only game in town if somebody wanted to worship God. So when Jesus had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables and said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now, Jesus making a whip and driving them out has sometimes been interpreted as Jesus actually whipping the, the merchants themselves. And with this picture in mind, many people bring up this incident, or else the other one at the end of Jesus' ministry, which was similar, as examples of Jesus favoring violence. Um, when you actually take Jesus' words seriously about turning the other cheek and, uh, you know, having a, a, a gentle response to those who are your enemies and things like that, loving your enemies, blessing those who curse you, and so forth, people often point to this incident or this kind of activity of Jesus, since he did it twice, and they say, see, well, Jesus even drove the money changer out of the temple. Actually, even if you talk about the subject of Christian participation in war, which is ethically ambiguous, definitely. I mean, many people feel it's biblically defensible and may feel like it's not. But if you happen to take the side toward pacifism or non-participation of Christians in warfare, certainly the other side, I know, I've heard it all the time, they continuously say, ah, but Jesus drove the money changer out of the temple. Well, I don't know that we can really, uh, it, with any simplicity, and with any uh, brevity of discussion, settle the matter of whether war is always ethical or unethical for Christians. But it certainly is irrelevant to say, well, Jesus drove the money changer out of the temple. There's nothing comparable to, to war in this. For one thing, war, when it is objected to, is usually objected on the basis of killing people. It's usually because you're shedding human blood that people raise questions about its ethical nature. Jesus didn't kill anyone. Furthermore, Jesus did not, as far as we know, strike anyone. The Bible says in all the accounts that he took a whip and drove them out and their animals. And as far as we know, he only whipped the animals to get them stampeding. And, you know, animal lovers might say, well, that's not very nice to whip the animals. That's how you get animals to move. <laughs> I mean, there's these oxen in, in, the, in the temple precincts. How do you get them to move? Start pushing them? You know, I mean, they're big animals. You have to whip them, and then they start moving to get away from the whip. It probably doesn't hurt very much, but even if it did, they're just animals. There's no reason to believe that Jesus whipped people. Though, frankly, if he had, I wouldn't have minded, you know. I mean, he's had every right to drive, to forcibly drive people out of his father's house. Just like if you came home to your parents' house and it was also your home and you came there and found people doing things there, having a big party there, doing things your parents wouldn't approve of, you know, getting drunk and watching, you know, porn and things like that, and, you, and you've got godly parents and someone, how these people come into their house and, you know, defiling it, you might just, you know, physically manhandle some of those people and throw them out the door. That's, Jesus had every right to do that. It's his father's house. That's not what his father wanted being done there. But I don't think he had to do that. I think what he did is he drove the animals out and he knocked over the tables with their coins and you know where the man's money is, he's going to go after it. He didn't have to, chase, he didn't have to hit the people, they're going to go after their merchandise. So Jesus has to just get the merchandise out of there and then the merchants will go after it lest they lose all their stuff. 
So there's never any place in the Bible that indicates that Jesus whipped a person. He may have, but, but there's no reason to believe that he did. He didn't need to in order to accomplish what he did, and the Bible doesn't ever say that he did. But he did drive them out, and apparently in acts that would have appeared violent, I'm sure that every dramatization of this in Christian movies, and even in our minds, pictures a rather, you know, perturbed, angry, shouting kind of Jesus, and that may be exactly what he was. Although it doesn't necessarily say he was shouting. He could have driven the cattle out without doing that. But getting angry, and this doesn't say he got angry, but it certainly looks like he got angry, is, a, is not always a sin. Anger is often a sin, and the Bible often speaks of it as something that we should not have, but Jesus did get angry, although zeal is the word that is used in describing his attitude, but zeal for a good thing can be anger at a bad thing, certainly. But to say that Jesus was sometimes angry, we can, we can be sure of that, because in chapter 3 of Mark, we read this. There was a, Jesus was in the, tavern, or in the uh, synagogue on a Sabbath day, and there was a man there with a withered hand. And it says in Mark chapter 3, verse 2, and they watched him, that is, his enemies watched him, to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, because that was considered to be not okay, to heal on the Sabbath. So they wanted to see if they could catch him doing something wrong and, and nail him for that. And it says in verse 3, And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Now he knew very well these people were watching him, so he was going to give them something to see. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. Why? Why didn't they answer? Because they were looking for something to accuse him of. He had them on the horns of a dilemma. He gave them only two choices and no, and no middle ground, just a dichotomy. You can, what, let's see, there's two things you can do, good or evil. Which one is lawful to do on the Sabbath? Well, no one's going to say it's lawful to do evil on the Sabbath because it's never lawful to do evil. They couldn't say that. The only thing they could answer is, well, I guess, good. But then they'd be given permission to heal then because that's arguably good. I mean, they don't want to give him permission to do anything. But he gets them in a position where they're, like I said, on the horns of a, of a rhetorical dilemma. Is it lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath? Well, certainly not evil, so I guess good. But we're not going to say that because that then removes all of our opportunity to accuse him when he does something that's good. So they kept silent and would not answer. It says, and when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So. Uh, it says that Jesus had anger toward them. And we see anger probably, I mean, it, it, it doesn't use the word angry in these accounts of him cleansing the temple. There, there appears to be anger in his words and his actions. And that's not a sin. Anything Jesus does is not a sin. Now, we might say, well, Jesus, being God, has every right to be angry. We don't, and therefore it's a sin for us to be angry, but not for him. Yet Jesus though we do believe Jesus is God, he also is the model man. He also is the example. It's in the Gospel of John that he says to his disciples in chapter 13, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Of course, in that case, he was talking about washing their feet, but in general, his life was to them an example for them to follow. As much when he cleansed the temple as when he washed their feet or did anything else. Jesus always acted consistently with the way a godly man should act. And therefore, we have to say it's not necessarily wrong in every case to be angry. It depends on a number of things. There's a difference between sinful anger and godly anger. One of the primary differences would be a sinful man is usually angry on his own behalf. He gets angry at the people who hurt him, who wrong him and who injure him. And whereas a Christian is supposed to not be angry at that, they're supposed to forgive. If somebody despitefully uses you and abuses you, then bless them, Jesus said. Do good to them. Be kind to them. Pray for them, Jesus said. Turn the other cheek when they strike you. You can absorb injuries if you have the Spirit of Christ. He did. 
He wasn't angry at people on this occasion because they did anything to him. It was his father's house that he was concerned about. This was a dishonoring of God. And Jesus was zealous for God. That's what it says. The disciples remembered the scripture that said, The zeal for your house has eaten me up. Jesus was consumed with enthusiasm over God's reputation. The zeal for God's house was what was motivating him. And in this case, it apparently made him angry. But anger isn't a sin necessarily. If you're angry on behalf of someone else entirely, this is a totally disinterested anger. Disinterested means not having, you have nothing to gain from it. It's not, it's not your issue personally. When you hear of injustices done on the other side of the world to people you don't even know, but it makes you angry, then that's a disinterested anger. It doesn't have anything to do with you personally. But you just are angry because there's something to be angry about, and any righteous person would be angry about it. There are things that are so uh, worthy of our anger that we would be remiss to not be angry with them. If, if you can remain calm in the face of horrendous evil, done to innocent victims, then that's not spiritual, that's apathy. There are such awful crimes done to innocent people that we hear about that if we don't get angry about it, we're just going to become numb to moral issues altogether. Anger is the right response to certain things, but the thing is when, when you are the victim, although it's equally wrong for you to be victimized by people as anyone else, you should have enough of the Spirit of Christ that, and enough love even for your enemy that you can absorb the injury without responding in uh, hatred and anger and the need to get revenge. Those are the things we're told not to do. And we can see so that Jesus said when someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to the other also. It is you in this case, not your wife, your children, your neighbor who's getting uh, attacked. It's you. But what if it's somebody else who's being attacked? Then that's obviously a different scenario and different motivation. Some people, uh, when I've advocated turning the other cheek, they say, well, what would you do if someone was going to uh, uh, kill your, your wife? I say, well, I'd physically resist them any way I could. But you don't have to make it my wife. Make it anyone's wife or anyone's children, anyone, any innocent victim. It's not just my family I'm concerned about. It's not just me and my interests. If it is, then, then it's still all about me, and my anger is just a selfish anger. If it's that I am angry at all those who would afflict all victims who are innocent, then my anger is at injustice in the abstract. It might even be that I, I have some measure of compassion uh, toward the person who's perpetrator, but I'm still angry at the injustice of it. That's not sinful to be angry at injustice or angry at sacrilege. You still have to be, in some sense, at some level, loving toward the person even who's committing it, because God loves them. God loves his enemies. God loves sinners, and so should we. But he's also angry at sinners every day, it says in the Psalms. Can you be angry at someone and love them at the same time? Of course, ask any mother <laughs> or father. When your children are, you know, they just, they do the wrong thing continually. If they've been told the right thing, you get exasperated. Now, if you get exasperated just because you're impatient, then that's your bad, you know? But if, if it's because you love them and you're concerned about them learning the lessons that they need to learn for their good in life, it, there's a different aspect to that. You, you get frustrated and angry because you love them, not because you don't. And, uh, you know, when people do things that are endanger themselves, and they're, they're not wise enough to heed counsel or instruction so that, you know, they're going to hurt themselves. It's, it's easy to get angry at somebody for that because you care about them, not because you don't. And so the motivation of anger, whether it's a self-centered thing, whether it's just a, another manifestation of my focus on myself and my rights and my injuries and, and, and me, anything that is focused and motivated that way is part of the flesh, it's just part of the, it's, it's sinfulness. It's part of my tendency to put myself at the center of the universe and expect the universe to cater to me. That's what we do by nature from birth. Conversion refocuses, recenters that thing so that God's concerns and the concerns of others are more important than our own. And then there are things to get angry about that it's not wrong to be angry about. When Jesus was angry in the synagogue at the, at the men who were 
not willing to answer him honestly when he said, is it lawful to do good or evil? He was angry because they were more concerned about their religious rules, enough so even to not even be honest enough to give the answer they knew was right because they'd have to lose a point in this, in this tension between him and them. They didn't want to lose any position of theirs. And for that, they'd be willing to let this man who lived with a lifelong injury to his arm remain crippled rather than give in and say, you know, you're right, Jesus. It is lawful to do good. Please heal that man. You know what I mean? They, they, this, their religious attitudes victimized people and prevented them from being helped. And, and Jesus was more the reflection of where God's heart was at. God wanted them to be helped. If you come to the synagogue to worship God, but you don't love your brother, you might as well not even come. And they were there with an attitude to, to find fault, to criticize, to keep Jesus from doing good things on the Sabbath that help people. That made him angry, not because, of the, not because they were plotting against him. When they finally caught him and put him on a cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He didn't appear to be angry there. Let them kill him. That won't make him angry. But let them victimize people in the name of God. That made his blood boil. For, that, for the victim's sake and for God's sake. That religious leaders would so misrepresent God's interests that the people who are getting their concepts of God from these leaders would misinterpret what God even is about. This made him angry. And I really think that there's problems like that throughout church history, that there are many people who want nothing to do with the church because the church has misrepresented God so much. Uh, and, and we can easily, we, have, we who are of the Protestant stream can easily look back at the Middle Ages when it was just the Roman Catholic Church and all the abuse there. All the, you know, bilking of the poor to build big cathedrals and all the corrupt bishops and popes and all the use of fear and terror to keep people in line and making God seem very, very angry and giving people the impression that if they give them a, enough money they'll get people out of purgatory. I mean, all this perversion of the gospel just makes God out to be a totally different kind of being than he is. But Coming out of the Roman Catholic thing in the Reformation hasn't, hasn't purged the church of all of that. Even, even in Protestant circles, it's very common to give people the impression that God is easily angered. When the Bible says he's slow to anger and plenty of mercy. That God will take pleasure in burning people forever and ever in hell. When the Bible says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, much less the torture of them. The, the character of God is so misrepresented by the leaders of Christianity that people who would really love God if they encountered him often are driven away from him. They, they're turned off by the name of Jesus because they think he is what, what the Christian leaders have represented him as. And sometimes it's been a misrepresentation. That makes Jesus angry at them. When people who would love God if they saw him as he is are driven away from him because he's misrepresented by his spokespersons, that's ang that makes him angry. Remember what he did to Moses? He said, Moses, go speak to the rock and tell it to give water. Moses was angry. God wasn't. And Moses goes out there as if God's representative said he, he's angry at the people. And says, you rebels, must I strike this rock to give you water? Well, God had told him to speak to it, not to strike it. And he struck the rock, and God graciously gave water, but then God took Moses aside and said, Moses, uh, got a little something to talk about here. <laughs> That's not what I told you to do. That did not represent me correctly. You did not sanctify me before the people. Therefore, it's going to cost you. You cannot go into the promised land. Moses, who had suffered so much for God's sake, Moses, who had been so obedient for 120 years, uh, you know, now he can't. And, he, and, God, and Moses complained to God about that later, many times. He said, now God, can we renegotiate that? God said, don't bring that up again. You're not going in because you did not sanctify me before the people. Wow. Because he gave the impression that God was angry when he wasn't. He gave the impression that God was, had a short fuse when God does not. It was Moses that had the fuse that was short. By this time, I, I don't know. I'd say Moses had a short fuse. It took him, a, he took a lot of guff before he ever got that angry. But he, his fuse ran out before God's did, and he gave the impression that God was at the end of his patience, and he wasn't. And that cost Moses because 
you, you, know, you have to represent God rightly if you're the spokesman for God. You can't tell people that God is a certain way that's, that's, that misrepresents him. Because then the people who, who wouldn't really be turned off by God are turned off by the God you present. You almost have to wonder sometimes about the people who are not Christians in our society. I know that when we talk about, what about those who've never heard about Jesus? Sometimes when we think about the unreached peoples, we think, well, maybe, you know, God has a special uh, dispensation of mercy for those who are, you know, innocently <coughs> ignorant, never have heard. I mean, maybe there's, if they respond to the light they have, maybe he'll, be, they'll be, he'll give them mercy. But those in America, those in the West who've heard the gospel, no excuse for them. I wonder if the Jesus they've heard of is the Jesus of the television evangelist, the Jesus of the Word of Faith movement, or the Jesus of some other misrepresentation of what Jesus is like, maybe they haven't rejected Jesus. Maybe they haven't even heard about him. They've heard of another Jesus. You know, Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 that he was afraid that if someone would preach another Jesus to them, they might accept it. 2 Corinthians 3, uh, no, it's not uh, verse 11. Um, I'm getting the wrong reference here. It's 2 Corinthians 11. And um, it is actually verse 4. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you might well put up with it. He's concerned about that. I'm afraid you might actually accept another Jesus that someone would preach. In other words, it's a virtuous thing to reject the wrong Jesus. And it's possible that there's many people in this country who say, well, they've got no excuse. They've got religious television. They've got religious books. They've got churches everywhere. If they reject Jesus, they're, you know, they're, they're rejecting light. Well, maybe what they're rejecting is actually dark. Maybe the, the Jesus that was presented to them, maybe by the church or maybe their parents, Frankly, a lot of people were raised in Christian homes, but where the, the parents are abusive or, you know, drunkards or all kinds of things. And, and, you know, a child grows up saying, okay, so that's what a Christian is. That's what Jesus stands for. They get the impression Jesus is, uh, is not real. And it's not really that the, the child is rejecting the real Jesus. They have not seen or heard of the real Jesus. They've heard of someone called Jesus who is represented by this kind of hypocrisy or some other misrepresentation. What they reject may well be another Jesus, not the real Jesus. And who knows how God will judge those. I don't know. I remember I have a friend whose mother, all the years I knew him in my youth, uh, he was concerned about his mother. He's praying for her because she was, she was in a church. She was, a, she was in a Presbyterian church. And regular there, but she didn't really, she was not an evangelical and she didn't know the Lord. But I remember seeing him after some years of not seeing him and asking him, how's your mother doing? He said, well, she's still about the same, no better. And they said, but I'm not sure who's at fault for that, her or the church she's going to, you know. And uh, that, that really got me thinking because I had never thought of it that way, you know. I, maybe she's not so much closed down to God as as the church is failing to present God to her. And you might say, well, she'd go to another church if she wants. Well, she could, but lots of people don't know that Jesus is presented differently in different churches. The church they're raised in is the one that they know. That's the one, that's the Jesus they think is in the Bible. And this is, it is so important for Christians to correctly represent Jesus, especially those who are in pulpits and those who speak for him, because if Jesus is misrepresented, then he may be rejected by people who don't really want to reject him. What they're rejecting might be something he himself would reject. You know? He himself may be glad they're rejecting what they're hearing because it isn't really him. So, and I, I don't, that's not answering the question. I can't answer the question, what will God do in judging people in that situation? All I'm saying is that it does underscore the tremendous responsibility on those who are spokesmen for God and who run the religious institutions and so forth that they do not give people the wrong idea. And it made Jesus mad. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that makes 
anger, righteous, as opposed to carnal, is that you're concerned for the glory of God, you're concerned for the people that God's concerned about, they're being victimized, worst of all, if they're being victimized by the religious establishment that's corrupt. It's bad enough when they're victimized by con men and, and, and criminals and other wrongdoers, but when the wrongdoers are the ones who are the public representatives of God, that's, that's worse yet. To be angry, to not be angry at that is to be, it's almost like not being on God's side. Uh, let me show you something interesting about this. I know I get it off on tangents, but this is this is relevant to uh, knowing what God is like. Um, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 21 and 22. David says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Now that doesn't sound very pure in heart. And yet look at his very next words. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of blessing. David says, I don't know of any wicked way in me, but let me know. God, search my heart and see. Well, isn't it kind of on the surface there? <laughs> you know? When you say, I hate those people, I loathe them, I count them, isn't that kind of wickedness in the heart? I don't think so. I think David felt perfectly pure conscience about his attitude. Why? I mean, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Well, David wasn't talking about his enemies. He was talking about God's enemies. He said, I count them my enemies. Not because they are, but because they're your enemies, and I'm on your side, God. If those who anger you, well, I'm taking your side against them. By the way, when we read about hatred in the Old Testament, even the Old Testament says that God hates certain people. Seven things God hates, or six things God hates, seven are abominations to them. But, you know, many of those things are people. He hates him that sows discord among brethren, it says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 19. That's a person. God hates that person. What does it mean God hates them? Doesn't, doesn't the Bible say God loves sinners? Well, he does, and I think this is something that confuses people, but it's, it's quite easily cleared up. The word hatred, or the word hate, obviously in different usages, can mean the opposite of love. Or it can be the opposite of liking. Those are very two different things. You can love somebody, but not like very much about them. You don't like their life. You don't like their uh, values. You don't like what they're doing. You don't like what they're thinking. You don't like the things they say, because they're wicked and evil or foolish things. You don't like them. Liking has to do with enjoyment of something. Do you like sauerkraut? Well, some people do. Some don't. That means they enjoy it or they don't enjoy it. Liking has to do with your tastes. It has to do with what you enjoy or don't enjoy. There's no obligation to enjoy anything in particular about someone. You're not required to like persons. You are required to love them. And we think of love as more of an intense form of liking. Like, I like this person, but I really like that one a lot. I'm going to say I love that person. Because we think of loving as simply the more intensified phenomenon of liking. But love in the Bible is not even related to liking. You can love the person that you don't like at all. You don't enjoy anything about them. Nothing about them is pleasant. They may hate you. They may persecute you. They may not have one enjoyable thing about them, but you are to love them. What does that mean? It means you put their interests on the level that your own interests are. You consider they're as valuable in the sight of God as you are. They're made in the image of God just like you are. You care about their soul as you care about your own soul. You would not wish them ill. You'd wish them well. You hope they come to Christ. You hope that things don't go badly for them. These are the, this is what loving someone means. It means that you are committed to their well-being and to their, and to their uh, good. You might not like them at all. It's possible not to like them. Brussels sprouts, but go ahead and eat them because it's your duty to do so. And it's possible not to like a certain kind of person, 
And you're not required to like them, but you are required to go ahead and love them, lay your life down for them, serve them. When they're hungry, feed them and so forth. That's what, that's what it says in, uh, not only in Proverbs, but Paul quotes this proverb in uh, Romans 12. At the end of Romans 12, he says, Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. He's your enemy. You're not going to enjoy having an enemy. But if he's in need, love will care about his needs. You'll feed him. Love is proactively seeking his good and his well-being. That's what love is. Even at, your own, at the sacrifice of your own self. Greater love has no one than this that they lays down his life for his friend. So, God loves everybody, but doesn't like everybody. There are things that disgust him. And when we say, I love you, that might, or I should say, when I say, I hate you, it might mean I don't love you. Because hate is a word that can be used as the opposite of love. But sometimes, and very often, hate is simply the opposite of liking. I don't like anything about you. I love you. And I will lay my life down for you, but I don't like you. Nothing about you pleases me. But I'm not going to require you to please me before I love you. I will love you whether you please me or not. And liking is, is being pleased by and enjoying something or someone. God is not pleased by, is not, does not enjoy, does not like people who do certain things. He loves them because he sent his son to change them and to save them from that. But he doesn't like it. And he dislikes it so much, he loathes it. And that's what David says there in Psalm 139, verse 21. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? There's, I find them disgusting. I find them repugnant. If you say, I hate such and such a food, because it, it doesn't meet with your tastes, you don't mean you hate it like you hate certain people that you wish evil upon. And there shouldn't be people you wish evil upon, because that kind of hatred is a sin. There is nobody that God wishes evil on, ultimately. There are, there are people that God will discipline with what, what is hard and painful to them, but it's, it's always with the mind, if possible, to restore them. He's never vindictive. He never just gets so upset with people that he's just going to take pleasure in torturing them. He doesn't like that. He has no pleasure in that, he says. So, God loves people, but he doesn't like everybody. David says, I'm on your side about that, God. If somebody doesn't like you, I don't like them. If somebody loathes you, then I will loathe them. If somebody has set themselves against you, I will be on your side instead of their side. And he says, I count them my enemies. They, they have not postured themselves against me. They have not attacked me. They hate you, God. And I will call them my enemies because I'm on your side and they're your enemies. And so to take God's side and be angry at what God's angry at is legitimate. It's not wrong. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry, but do not sin. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Then he says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Well, doesn't the Bible say we shouldn't be angry? Well, it, it does, actually, if you look a few verses further down in Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4.31, he says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. You put that away from you. That's how you be angry and do not sin. You put it away. You get angry at the right things, but you don't hang on to it. You don't let the sun go down on it. You don't make that the defining mood of your personality. You, you get angry appropriately, and then you put it away. You put away that anger. It's not sinful to, to feel it. It is sinful to hang on to it. And it's dangerous to sleep on it. And uh, so there's anger that is righteous, and there's anger that's not righteous. Anger, by the way, is a... It's a, it's, a, it's a proper reflex. Like when the doctor hits you in the right spot on the knee with his little hammer for your 
need to go on. There are things, there are certain moods and attitudes that are proper reflexes to a healthy soul. Even fear is healthy of a sort. The Bible continually says, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. And yet, it doesn't mean feeling fear initially is a bad thing. Anger and fear are both emotions that are very natural and appropriate responses to certain things. If a tiger walked in the back of the room, we realized that it had gotten out of the zoo, and we knew some of us were going to get eaten, to have a sensation of alarm and fear would be not a sin. In fact, God gives those emotions to animals to get them away from predators, too. You know, animals don't sin. It's not a moral issue. It's, a, it's almost an instinct of self-preservation that God has put in everyone so they don't stupidly do things that are going to destroy their lives. They, they avoid danger out of fear of it. That's right. When we're told not to be afraid, it's when we have a duty to do something that might be scary to do, but we're supposed to ignore the fear and do it anyway. There's no sin in feeling fear if there's something that inspires fear legitimately, but, but we're told not to allow fear, in any sense, to dictate our behavior. We do the right thing, even when it's scary. Same thing with anger. There's an appropriate feeling of anger. It's a natural response to injustice. But if it's injustice about against us, we must put that away and say, okay, that did make me angry, but uh, I will forgive. I will put that away. I will not go to bed angry about that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I can absorb that graciously. I don't have to let that ruin my spirit and, and corrupt my spirit and make me embittered and so forth. Now Jesus was angry, at least on the occasion that we read of in Mark chapter 4, and it looks like he was angry on this occasion. But here it is described as zeal for God's house. It was not a personal vendetta. It was not a response to personal attack against him. In fact, they probably didn't even know he was there until he showed up with the whip. No one was saying anything against him on that occasion. He had not even become controversial yet. In fact, this is one of the things that first caused him to be controversial and gave him some visibility. He got angry not when anyone was doing anything or saying anything about him, but when his father's house was being abused and, and this was compromising people's uh, love for God and worship of God. It said in verse 18, So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? Now, you don't usually just walk into a public place and act like you own it and drive people out. You definitely, if you walk into a mall and there's people trying to say, okay, everyone out of here, get out of here, you got five minutes, get out, everyone out. They say, well, well, why should we do what you're telling us to do? I mean, this is, we have as much right to be here as you do. You know, what authority do you have to drive us out of this place that's ordinarily okay for us to be? Who, who gave you the badge? Uh, well, that's what they're saying to Jesus. You're, this is a public place for the Jews to come and worship God. How can you throw these people out? What authority do you have? What sign can you give us that that tell us you really can do this and that we have to pay attention to what you're saying or, and you're not just some kind of a madman. And Jesus said, okay, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, because of their misunderstanding, they thought it only confirmed that he was a madman because they said in response, uh, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? Now, those 46 years were the years that Herod had been refurbishing the temple. The temple had been re, uh, erected on that spot in the days of uh, Zerubbabel, about 520 B.C., after the, Jews, after the Babylonian captivity ended and, and the remnant of Israel came back to Judah, and they built the temple that the Babylonians had burned down earlier. And uh, that temple stood from the time of Zerubbabel up until... Uh, you know, 70 AD, but in the approximate half century before Jesus began his ministry, Herod had put a lot of money and labor and expense into making the temple more elaborate. It, uh, it was rather tawdry, it was rather cheap in the days of Zerubbabel because they had a, a limited budget. And they didn't have all the materials that Solomon had, had earlier when he built the original temple. And so they made sort of a, uh, a scaled down, uh, less impressive version in the days of Zerubbabel. And Herod, in order to ingratiate himself with the Jews, made it one of his major building projects that he put a lot of 
money into making that temple a beautiful structure, one of the seven wonders of the world. And so that had been going on for 46 years at the time that Jesus made this statement. He said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Now, they obviously thought he was nuts, but he let them think that. He didn't say, well, I realize that sounds kind of crazy, but let me explain what I'm talking about here. Of course, if he had explained what he was talking about, he'd sound even more nuts. <laughs> because he meant, if you destroy my body, I'll raise it up from the dead in three days, and they would have thought, that's even more crazy. So Jesus just spoke the truth and let the, let the chips fall. You know, if people think he's nuts, that's what they're going to have to think. And we're told he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So apparently this uh, you know, went out of their, their heads for a while. They didn't remember that he'd said this until after he rose from the dead. And hey, you know what? That, that must be what he said, meant when he said that thing about destroy this temple. He rose on the third day. He raised the temple. He is the temple. He is the house of God. He is the place where the word who was God tabernacled among us. God's presence dwelt and manifested among his people in Jesus, as in the temple previously. As the glory of the Lord had filled the temple in Solomon's day, so the glory of the Lord was now seen in Jesus, the glory as of the only begotten of a father, full of grace and truth. Jesus' body was the temple, the habitation of God on earth. Now what the Bible teaches in the afterward parts of the sequel, after Jesus rose from the dead and went to heaven, and part of his spirit, the Bible everywhere says that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus and the temple of the Holy Spirit are interchangeable concepts. His body was the temple that he was talking about. Now, his body is corporate, made up of many members. To consider it as a temple, it is made up of many stones. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 5, that we are like living stones built up together into a spiritual house. 1 Peter 2.5. There are actually a number of places we don't have time to look at in the New Testament that identify the church today as the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. These ideas of the body of Jesus, temple of the Holy Spirit, these are interchangeable, and he used them interchangeably here, but this time it was his own individual body because the body of Christ was not yet corporate. His disciples did not yet have the Spirit. They were not yet the habitation of God. They would be, as he told them in the last supper and at the upper room, he told them that the Holy Spirit would come to them and they would be inhabited by him too. But at this point in time, Jesus was the sole member of the body of Christ and the sole stone of the temple. He's the whole temple in one man. He said, you destroy this temple, meaning his body, I'll raise it up. The disciples didn't understand that any more than the Pharisees or the chief priests did on this occasion, but they remembered it later. When they knew he'd risen from the dead, it made sense. And then the last three verses of this chapter. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when he, they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. These verses actually ought to be a new chapter. You know the chapter divisions of the Bible are man-made. The, the authors of the Bible didn't divide their work into chapters and verses. This was, these divisions were made later. And therefore, they are subject to error. And I think that it was a mistake. It seems like uh, verse 22 should have been the last verse of chapter 2. And the reason I say that is because verse 23 obviously starts a new direction. And that new direction leads up to Nicodemus coming to him. Because it says in verse 23, many believed when they saw the signs he did. One of those was Nicodemus who came to him night and said, we know you're from God because no one can do these signs. So it's like a, a, a turn in the story after verse 22. In fact, uh, although we've read these verses, I think I'm going to hold off on them, speaking about them until next time so we can take them along with uh, this, the story of Nicodemus because they really are the, the run-up to that conversation. And so we'll stop at this point and take those last verses of chapter 2 along with chapter 3 next time.